In this lesson, we're going to continue exploring nucleophilic substitution at tetrahedral carbon, beginning with the discussion of how to predict whether the SN1 or SN2 mechanism is operating based on the structures of the nucleophile and electrophile and other aspects of the reaction conditions. We're then going to look at some specific contexts in which substitutions are relevant, intramolecular reactions and reactions of epoxides. And finally, we're going to close with a quirk of the SN1 reaction mechanism involving the 1,2-R or 1,2 rearrangement elementary step. This can occur when a carbocation that forms in the course of an SN1 mechanism can rearrange to a more stable intermediate. Let's begin with the discussion of how to predict the mechanism of a nucleophilic substitution reaction. The essential question here is whether the reaction is concerted involving an SN2 type mechanism or the reaction takes place in a stepwise fashion via SN1. Given the structures of the nucleophile and electrophile in a particular reaction and some other aspects of the reaction conditions, we can predict whether SN2 or SN1 will occur with relative ease. In fact, we've already seen the two key factors that govern whether SN1 or SN2 will occur. Carbocation stability, which tends to favor the SN1 mechanism, and steric hindrance, which tends to discourage SN2. The SN1 reaction occurs only when a stable carbocation intermediate is involved. Previously, we discussed how, via an inductive effect, the number of alkyl groups linked to a carbocation, or the substitution pattern, determines the stability. More alkyl groups makes a more stable carbocation. For our purposes, there's a clean dividing line between primary and secondary carbocations. Primary carbocations, for our purposes, will not form in reaction mechanisms. They're too unstable. And the same is true of methyl carbocations, which lack substituents completely. The one exception to this idea, which isn't really an exception at all, are cations characterized by resonance stabilization, that is, delocalization of the positive charge over multiple atoms. These cations can and often do form in SN1 reactions. And the tertiary and secondary carbocations are, of course, fair game in SN1 reactions as well. One thing to keep in mind is that you do need to consider how departure of the leaving group in the original electrophile can give rise to these intermediates. So for example, a methyl carbocation is going to come from a methyl halide or pseudo halide. A primary carbocation would come from a primary halide or pseudo halide, and likewise for the secondary and tertiary cases. The methyl and primary substrates which would give rise to these unstable intermediates can engage only in the SN2 reaction. This means that in reactions with relatively weak nucleophiles, these substrates tend to not react or react only very slowly. The key to the SN2 reaction is an unhindered environment at the electrophilic atom, typically carbon. Tertiary substrates react extremely slowly, in fact, don't really react at all in SN2 reactions. Secondary substrates are okay but react relatively slowly, and primary and methyl substrates tend to react quite quickly in SN2 reactions. Here again, there's a very clean dividing line between tertiary substrates and all of the others. Tertiary substrates are off-limits to the SN2 reaction. These don't react at all in SN2 because of the steric hindrance at the electrophilic position. Another situation that's worth mentioning is that certain types of primary substrates are also unreactive in SN2 reactions if the carbon adjacent to the carbon bearing the leaving group is a tertiary carbon itself. This is referred to as a neopental situation since the five carbons implied here, 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 and here, form what's called a neopental group. The three carbons linked to this beta position form a kind of shield that prevents the electrophilic carbon from reacting. And so here again, the neopental halides or pseudohalides do not react in SN2 either. One last thing worth mentioning concerns the strength and structure of the nucleophile and how this plays into whether SN1 or SN2 occurs. And this is especially important in reactions of secondary substrates, as we've seen that these can react either through the SN1 or SN2 mechanisms. Strong nucleophiles, which tend to be anionic and strong bases, the exact same ideas apply, engage in the SN2 reaction. This is because they have the strength, they have the reactivity to expel the leaving group on their own. They don't need to wait for the leaving group to depart on its own. For weak nucleophiles, of course, the situation is the exact opposite. A weak nucleophile doesn't have the Lewis basicity or the Lewis basic strength to push off a leaving group, even those that we would consider a good leaving group. For this reason, 
they have to wait until the leaving group has departed. In other words, they engage in substitution through a stepwise process, SN1. The text shown on this slide comes from a seminal paper that discusses how structure affects the mechanism of nucleophilic substitution reactions. And the last statement shown on this slide expresses the dependence of the mechanism on electrophile structure that we discussed through much of this video. The authors talk about the electron releasing capacity of the alkyl group or groups linked to the electrophilic position. Essentially what they're saying here is a result that we've already seen as we progress in structure from a primary to a tertiary alkyl halide or pseudo halide, the mechanism transitions from fully SN2 to fully SN1, with the situation in the middle being governed by the nature of the nucleophile. Although the language is a little bit old fashioned, I would encourage you if you'd like to learn more about the dependence of substitution on structure to check out this paper.